Bill this morning. Looks like uh, everybody's doing quite well, settling in. We'd like to also welcome those of you who are joining us around the planet uh, via the internet. I uh, hope you've had a wonderful day as well, and we're delighted that you're tuning in. Uh, this is going to be uh, our final presentation, and so uh, where we're going to go with this is we're going to go right back to where we started in the beginning, okay? But before we do that, let me just mention to you that we are not going to be using the projector. We're going to be using the, the board over here. <clears throat> you see, that projector only gives you just a teeny little bit of exercise, <laughs> like that, okay? And I'm a kinesthetic person, and so I like to move, and uh, I like to be active, and so forth. And besides, it's my birthday, so I can do what I want, okay? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> So, yes, 29 again. So, <clears throat> Let me, uh, let's go ahead and start off with a word of prayer together, though, okay? Let's bow your heads. Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much for life this day and another birthday. And it's amazing how much you bless us, and even more amazing how much we take you for granted. I pray that our hearts will be receptive to all the things. I hope that there'll be a sensitivity to all the things that you do for us. Not only the obvious blessings, but, but the things that we do take for granted. Life and health and strength, the ability to see and read and move and work, all those things, all those things are a blessing from you. So thank you very much. And thank you for the folks that are here and those that are tuning in. We pray, Lord, in this last presentation that our hearts and minds will be open and receptive and that we'll hear that still small voice speaking to us. Time is of the essence and we know there's much work to be accomplished. And so, Father, equip us for the task ahead is my prayer in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Okay, we're going to go right back. I'm going to go to the screen here for just a minute. <clears throat> and the first presentation that we, that we started with was growing beyond belief to the place where we do what? Where we know, not just believe. To know is to believe with certainty. And that's really what this word is. It's certainty. Okay? <clears throat> now if I were to add this on to the end of it, <laughs> knowing... And I think of uh, Romans chapter 13 and verse 11. It tells me that I'm going to be knowing knowing the time. Knowing the time that it's high time to awake from our sleepiness. Because why? Because our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Okay? So Paul is pretty adamant. He, he believed that this applied to him. And if we go through generation and generation and century and century, every century, every generation believed that the time was close, that the time was near. But God's Word is set up on a blueprint. It's like a marriage, like a Middle Eastern marriage. And what we want to do to start with, uh, you'll notice that my timeline is not nearly as fancy as Tom's, okay? But that's because um, he was just pushing a button. I'm just, I'm working, I'm working it, okay? And we'll see if we can kind of keep it. All right. 6,000 years 
We'll call that, and we'll call this the 1,000 years. Now, I believe God is working from a timetable, and if Paul's saying that we should know the time, I, I see that there'll come a, a moment when we'll be able to look at the book, decipher the book, and the Spirit of God will set home to us how this blueprint is going to work. Now, I don't know if this presentation would have been better to do before his because he was dealing with a lot of the detail. Okay? But let me break this down a little bit because that's what I like to do. I like to start with the whole perspective and then work into the detail. Okay? Now, there's a reason why I'm looking at this, and it's called, probably familiar with it, familiar with it the Great Week of Time. Okay? People have written books about it. It's been talked about actually for centuries, okay? But there's something about this right here that clues us in about the total 7,000-year cycle. How many of you are familiar with the, uh, the Shemitah principle, right? Many of you probably have heard of the Shemitah principle, right? Pardon me? Yeah, the seven-year rest cycle. Okay. Now, when you go into Jeremiah, when you go into Daniel chapter 9, for example, Daniel talks about the 70-year captivity. Okay. Why, why was Israel taken captive for 70 years? Because they had violated 70 Shemitah cycles over a period of 490 years. And uh, they went... <laughs> they, they actually came up with some, some quite brilliant excuses as to why they didn't want to cooperate with God. Now, what was God trying to do with this? What was, why did God say, let the land rest every seven years so that He could do what? Teach faith. Okay, develop that relationship. I mean, He, was, he actually built it into their economy. It was part of their, their economy. And it was to build faith and trust because he had promised, right? So, the land was to rest. Now, this thousand year period are actually a thousand Shemitah years when the land is to be at rest. And if we know this is a thousand Shemitah, uh, if we understand that, then we, it mandates that the cycle is only 7,000 years long. Okay? So I hope you can catch that and follow that. We can break this down into three dispensations of time, and then, of course, this would be the last one here. And I think I put these on the board the other day, and you'll remember them. And, of course, I call this the Adamic, right? Why do I call this the Adamic dispensation? You can remember, okay? Because the first man was Adam, right? We'll call that year one. The first year was Adam. And the Adamic dispensation, of course, you have a flood here. You can start, once you get a timeline, you can start plugging in different perspectives and different events in Scripture. And you can add up the times. We know that Noah lived 350 years after the flood. We know approximately 1,650 transpired to the flood. So we've got a 2,000-year period of time here. Now, when Noah dies, there's another fellow that, that Yahweh calls. And that would have been Abram, okay, or Abraham. Abraham's about 58, 60 years old when this, when this occurs. He's the father of the Jewish nation, the Jewish dispensation. When does their probation end? When does the probation for the Jewish nation end? Okay. Messiah is, is put on the cross here. Three and a half years later, you have the stoning of Deacon Stephen. It's about 34 AD. Okay. Now, if you go back to here, according to our estimates, this is about 1967 B.C. when that's taking place. And so what happens is we see here 
potentially another 2,000 year duration of time. Okay? When we come up to here, if we only have 6,000 years of probation, because this is a 7,000 year cycle, then what's left? Another 2,000 year cycle. Now, you know, I, I see, again, having a contractor background and looking at blueprints and so forth, I see the symmetry in uh, what Yahweh has set up to handle the, the sin problem the sin problem that developed on earth. And all of this ended up being a six-to-one ratio. Okay? We talked a little bit about that, I think, in one of the other meetings. If you go into the book, um, what you find are numerous, and I'm talking numerous, examples of this. It's almost as if uh, Yahweh was saying, this is going to be the cycle of time to handle the sin problem, but let me go ahead and give you a bunch of hints. So I'll set up the weekly cycle. What's the weekly cycle? Six days of labor, Sabbath left, Sabbath rest. So you have a six to one cycle. Okay. Um, how about the, um, uh, there, are, there are 30 or 40 different examples that I've documented in a manuscript that I put together. But there are many, many that you could think of right off the top of your head that are very obvious. Why would the Holy Spirit impress 40 different authors over a 1,600-year period to add so many examples of this 6 to 1 ratio? Yeah, we're, we're, we're dense, <laughs> trying to get it, you see. So you have uh, several back here. You have numerous ones here uh, associated with the, the tabernacle and the priesthood and... Uh, it's, it's absolutely incredible all the variety that exists with this, even in the, uh, the Christian dispensation. A lot of six-to-one ratios that are playing out. Okay? Because what, what does Yeshua want us to know? The time. Knowing the time that it's high time to awake out of our sleepiness because salvation is drawing nearer than when we first thought. You see? So, when we think, for example, of God's end-time people, where do we place them on the chart, right? They're, they're down here, right? The event's down here, and this is really what, this is the area here that Tom is really focusing on, okay? He's, he's on to something, because it's this period right here that's going to be the most critical for humanity. And that's because... Yahweh is going to preserve a witness of his own character. The character of his end time people will vindicate his character that's on trial. And so it's imperative that he have a group of people that come to the place in their understanding of, of what this is all about. Not just that we're coming to an end, but why we're coming to an end. And what's the purpose? What's the purpose of the remnant? You see. Is it just to endure? Is it just to hold out? Is it just to survive? You know, there are a lot of people out there in the world today that are prepping. They're buying bunkers and food, storing up ammunition, doing all those things. And they may even be believing that this is just a cyclical thing and we're going to weather the storm or we're going to come out on the other side and start over. No, my friend. It's coming to an end. You know, Tom talked about the close of probation is the most significant event that's going to occur. Okay? And if we have 6,000 years of probationary time, and then, of course, those 1,000 years of Shemitah rest, and uh, I was talking to Isabel. Where is Isabel? Oh, over there. We were talk I was talking to her, and she was asking about the millennium and, and so forth. And when Yeshua comes, we go up with him. We spend the millennium in heaven because the land is uninhabited. You follow that? Just like here. Uh, what was a, uh, designed to be a blessing for them turned into a judgment. And the land, <laughs> she was said, I'm gonna, if you're not going to honor me, I'm going to take you off the land. And that really is what's happening at the millennium. We're taking, the saints are taken off the land. But at some point, of course, obviously after this period, the holy city returns and... All people from all time are alive at one time in history. 
some to face final judgment, others in the city itself. But I want to kind of back up. I'm not focusing on that. I want to back up and talk about this remnant. This remnant people right here. One of the things that I think we need to understand is that uh, <laughs> Scripture, and particularly the book of Revelation, end up focusing clearly on this event right here and on this period of time. So I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Revelation. And I want to share something with you that maybe folks have not caught. You know, it's important when we study Scripture to get the context of what the book is actually trying to say to us. So the context is always very important. Chapter 1, okay, right at the very beginning. And I'm, I'm actually going to be uh, jumping down to verse 3. Uh, you know the first two verses there, the revelation of Jesus Christ. We'll come back to that. Revelation of Yeshua, which God gave to him to show his servants things which must shortly, shortly take place. And if you go down to verse 3, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written. The King James says, For the time is at hand. Well, what time is that? What time is that, you see? People would say, well, that could be the end time. Okay. Now, I think it's referring to, like I heard, the end time, this period right before probation closes. Okay? Now, that's just, a, that's just maybe a uh, perception on my part to begin with, but how do we know that for certain? Okay, how do we know that? Well, if you go to all the way to the end of the book, hold your finger there in chapter 1, go all the way to the end of the book, chapter 22, and we're going to find here nearly the same phrase is used. But it's important to note where it's used. Chapter 22 and verse, and verse 9 and 10 there. This is uh, John seeing the angel. And he's bowing down. And, and the angel says, you know, See that you do that not. I'm your fellow servant and your, of your brethren the prophets. And of those who keep the word of this book, worship God. And he said to me, the angel says to him, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. So that phrase is used twice, once at the beginning of the, of the book, and then, of course, once here at the end. So we're talking, we know we're talking about the same time, aren't we? The time is at hand. And then look at the very next verse. He was unjust, let him be unjust still. He was filthy, let him be filthy still. He was righteous, let him be righteous still. And he was holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. So what's the context? We see clearly the context of how this second phrase, dealing with the time as at hand, is used. It's used just prior to the close of probationary time. This is a declaration of the closing of probation. He that is... Filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. But he that is holy and righteous, they're sealed. This is the sealing right here. Everyone is sealed. Uh, it's just like uh, Yeshua closing the door, just like Yahweh closing the door of the, of the boat. Nobody gets off, nobody gets on. They're sealed in, you see. And here we have all humanity being sealed. And this involves everybody. This involves the, uh, the wicked dead and the wicked living and the righteous dead and the righteous living. Four groups of people are being represented here. And so what this means is that the, the book of Revelation, which is an unsealing of what was in Daniel, is specifically given for this period of time. Now, what do we do with a lot of the prophecies? What do we do with a lot of the chapters? A lot of the, you know, the seals and the trumpets and the, the seven churches and all that. We throw them back into history, don't we? We throw them back into history. Now, of course, what we're, uh, there's no question that, that uh, these applications are appropriate and understandable, okay? What happened 
for example, back in the days of the apostles, is they believed, they believed that they knew the time was near. The disciples truly believed that Yeshua was going to come soon. Things were going to wrap up. It didn't happen. You go a couple of centuries into the, into the future, and you, you come up to a fellow named Victorinus. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of him or not, but he was a, a Catholic monk, a Catholic priest. And he's the one, he's, he's one of the first ones that started to write a book, a commentary on the book of Revelation around the 4th or 5th century. And what, did, what conclusion did he come to? You know, he came to the conclusion that, you know, the seals and the trumpets and the churches, they were all periods of time covering the same period of time. Okay? And again, the reason why he was thinking that it was because, hey, he could look around. He could see that there was famine and pestilence in the land, that, the, that there were things that were going on, and he said, hey, the Lord must be coming soon. So these prophecies have to be relevant to my day. Just like we're saying, the prophecies are relevant to our day. But one thing they didn't have, they didn't have this blueprint understanding of this, uh, based on the 6 to 1 ratio. Okay? So they, they, were, they were a little premature in their, in their understanding of the whole blueprint concept, but they still believed that Yeshua was coming back. And so that's why they started making these applications to the chapters and events that we see listed in, in the book of Revelation. Okay? Now, really what they were doing and what they were accomplishing was something called, uh, Rose, the Hebrew interpretation. <laughs> she doesn't like it when I use the word exegesis. So I tell her, <laughs> interpretation. Okay? The Hebrew mindset, the Hebrew interpretation is multiple applications pointing to the ultimate fulfillment. And that is exactly what we have from Scripture. Multiple applications pointing to the ultimate fulfillment. The applications are legitimate. They're relevant, particularly if you're living in that time period. But they're just applications. They're not the final fulfillment because we haven't gone the distance that God established, the appointed blueprint that He established. Okay? Now, turn, turn back to Revelation chapter 1 for a minute. It's important when studying the book of Revelation, um, not only that we understand the foundation, and, and that's what I like about Scripture, it's when I talk about a blueprint, it's, it's actually like a construction project. You have a foundation, and the foundation is kind of a two-dimensional depiction. If you uh, went on to a construction site and you just saw the foundation and the ground there, it doesn't really give you a complete picture of what the structure is going to look like. Okay? It's not until you add the framing. Once you add the framing to the foundation, okay, and it's just an extension, the framing is just an extension of the foundation, now you're starting to get more of a three-dimensional concept of what the building is going to look like. And then, of course, you, know, you add all the, the things on to the framing of, uh, of the structure. Well, it's important not only to understand the foundation of uh, the book of Revelation and Scripture and the plan, but it's also important to understand the framing. And would anybody be surprised if I told you that the book, or suggested that the book of Revelation is framed up in a six-to-one ratio? Okay. Um, chapters one through six, right? And then you have chapter seven, then you have eight to 13, chapter 14, right? And then, of course, 15 to what, 21, or to 20, and then 21, and actually chapter 22 is kind of summary, taking us back to the first chapter. But I want to point something out about the first, the first verse, because that sets the context. First verse, chapter 1. You can tell me, what, somebody knows what it says right off without even reading it. What is it? It's the apocalypse of Yeshua and the Messiah, right? Okay. Isn't that what you read there? It's the revelation of Yeshua, okay? Uh, that's not, that's, that's done there, that's done on purpose. John did that on purpose under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But when we read that and then go to the next, through the next six chapters, 
we start applying things to other places other than to Yeshua. You follow me? The apocalypse. What is an apocalypse? It's an uncovering. It's a revealing. It's an exposing. Okay? That's what the word apocalypse means. That's why it's called the revelation. It's a revealing. It's the book of revealings. Well, the first six chapters are a revealing of Yeshua. And then once the end time remnant have a greater understanding of Yeshua and the the part he played in the plan of salvation, the seventh chapter deals with the development of the 144,000, the end time remnant. Okay? Chapters 8 and 13 start getting you into the, the trumpets and, and some of the devastation that will occur with the trumpets. And then what do you have in chapter 14? Again, you have the 144,000 again. Probation closes, and then you have the seven last plagues and the, the new earth and so forth. And then you have, you have God's people living in a new Jerusalem and a new earth eventually. So you can see how it's structured in a six-to-one ratio, even the book. And even though, to be honest with you, you know, the punctuation and the chapter divisions are not, we can't really say they're inspired, but in this case, it's very interesting that it works out that way, you see, very interesting. Revelation chapter 1, the apocalypse of of, uh, Yeshua the Messiah, the, the uncovering of the covering. That's really what it's saying there. Because Yeshua was the, he was the embodiment of the atonement, right? And the atonement means to cover, to satisfy. And so the first five words are saying the uncovering of the covering. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? The revealing, the exposing of the atonement. A greater understanding of the atonement is where we start. That's the context of where we start in the book of Revelation. And of course then we go on to see that the whole book itself deals with this period of time, specifically at the end. Now let me have you jump up to um, Revelation chapter 7 because this is where it starts to, you start to get more detail about those living at the end of time. And actually there's a bit of misunderstanding I feel, with uh, chapter 7 of Revelation. Chapter 7 of Revelation is really divided into three segments. But what we're finding uh, lately, and what's being taught, at least uh, that I've been hearing, is that uh, the 144,000 and the great multitude are one and the same group. Okay? And I don't know, that's, that's being highly promoted right now, and I think it's pretty dangerous. But I want to just go through this so you can see that there are three aspects here to the book, and we'll talk about some of the things in more detail. Uh, just starting in chapter 7 and verse 1, uh, John, John says, After these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, and uh, hopefully you guys have uh, reviewed these chapters uh, many times, holding the four winds of the earth, that the earth should not blow on the earth the sea or any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. Cry with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Don't harm the earth, the sea, or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And John says, I heard the number, I heard the number of those who were sealed. And of course, we know it says 144,000, and they go through uh, 12,000 out of each of the tribes. And it is significant that we begin with the tribe of Judah, okay? Because that was the tribe of, of the Messiah, of Yeshua. So that's, I've actually written a, a whole commentary on these 12 tribes that we don't have time to get into. But each of the names and the order that they're given is very significant in this, in this depiction here, okay? It's all very relevant and fairly easy to understand if you go through it logically. So you've got this development, this, this coming together of this group of, of remnant people, okay? Now, where is that taking place? Where is the sealing taking place? Where is God sealing His people? We're, well, the four heads, but I mean, geographically, we are on the earth, aren't we? 
where we've gone, you know, we're going through times of difficulty and so forth. And we're being sealed down here. We're not off the planet, we're on the planet. And then when you get to verse 9, John says, And after these things I looked and beheld a great multitude which no man could number. Now I want you to catch this. We've got two groups of individuals here. One group can be numbered. The other group cannot be numbered. Okay, So we're talking about two distinct groups, aren't we? And this group is of all nations, tribes, people, tongues, standing before where? Standing before the throne. So now where are we? Okay, we've gone now, we've transferred to heaven. So one group is numbered on earth, right? The other group is an unnumberable number, and they're in heaven around the throne, okay? And incidentally, uh, you may be surprised to know that there's a six-to-one ratio standing around the throne, okay? There's six distinct groups of beings, human and, you know, redeemed human beings and angels that are standing around the throne, okay? So God carries this principle and this ratio throughout all eternity, doesn't he? Because we come before him every Sabbath, right? Every Sabbath we come before him. And if you study it out, we don't have time to get into it now, but also the holy city has different representations of the six to one ratio. The tree of life also is a a reflection of a six to one ratio, all right? But again, that would be something that you guys can dig into a little bit later. All right, so you've got this great multitude before the throne, clothed with white robes, palm branches in their hands, and they're crying with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the 24 creatures, these are some of these groups I'm talking about, fell on their faces before the throne and they worshiped God, saying, Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Now there's a, a change now, again. There's a refocus when you start in verse 13. This is the third aspect of this chapter. Then one of the elders answered, saying unto me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? Now, it's kind of an interesting question since we just learned that everybody, is, everybody there is in a white robe with a palm branch. Okay, So why would... The angel, why would the elder here be asking this question? Who are, who are these over here? That, that kind of shows you that there are distinct groups around the throne. Because he's highlighting a particular group. Okay, do you see that? Who are these arrayed in white robes? Where did they come from? And I said to him, sir, you know. You know where they came from. These are, they, these are the ones who came out of great tribulation, washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the, the throne of God. They serve Him day and night in His temple, etc. So, I hope that you realize, probably many of you do, that this remnant, this group that are, that are saved, that live through to the very end, they end up with some special responsibilities in the kingdom of heaven. They, uh, they worship God, they serve God in His temple. Okay? And only this group are allowed. They're like the... Uh, like the tribe of Levi, if you go back in the Old Testament, who were, who were privileged to serve in the sanctuary. So you see a similarity here, okay? But notice what it says here. It says, these are they who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. What does that mean? What does that mean that they've washed their robes and made them white? If you go back just to chapter, chapter 6, If you go back to the uh, fifth seal, what you see there in chapter 6, verse 9, you see the the souls, right, who have been slain for the word of God and for their testimony which they held. And they cry with a loud voice, you know, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our, our blood on those who dwell on the earth. And then what's it say? Then a white robe was given to each of them. Okay? There's a distinction between those who have been given robes and those who wash their robes in the blood of the Lamb. There's a distinction here. You see that? Um, the distinction, and the, I guess probably the, the real obvious uh, distinction, is that 
probation has closed for the multitudes of people that will be in the kingdom as compared to those who will live through to the very end. All right? So you'll have a group of people, a remnant people, that will be called by Yeshua to persevere and to live all the way through, through the trumpets, through the close of probation, through the seven last plagues, to, to be alive to see Him come. All right? They're the ones that are pictured as washing their robes in the blood of the Lamb. Okay? Those that have been martyred or, or have been laid to rest, which would be everybody else that's going to be redeemed, um, maybe with a couple of exceptions, uh, like Moses and Elijah and that kind of thing that are already there, and the ones that were resurrected at the resurrection. But you can see the distinction. There's a, there's a distinction between the two. This is being highlighted in Revelation 7. Okay? So there's a, the vast majority of, of the redeemed will be given white robes, but there's a group, and only God knows who they are, that will live through to the end, and they will wash their robes in the blood of the Lamb. Now, what do you think that means? What's going to enable them to live through to the end? What's going to enable them to stand in the presence of Yeshua when He comes? Okay, their spirit and their faith. Their right, their right, well, not their righteousness, but their character, okay? But, you know, it's interesting that you say that because in chapter 19, it's talking about these people again, and it actually says their righteousness, Okay, so it's interesting that you say that. Chapter 19. Chapter 19 in verse 6, reading on down through there. It says, I heard as it were a voice of a, a great multitude as the sound of many waters and the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and His wife has made herself ready. The bride. Uh, the bride of Christ is, is not only the holy city, but it's the redeemed as well. Okay? But it's the redeemed having made themselves ready, you see. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen. Here's that same expression again that we find in chapter 7. Arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteousness, or the righteous acts, what? Of the saints. You see, it's, it's not, they don't have any really righteousness of their own, but it's the righteous acts that are being accomplished, and they're accomplishing them in the power of Yeshua. Okay? I was reminded, uh, chatting with uh, someone here this week, of an analogy that I've used uh, many, many, many times. And maybe it's appropriate more so here because uh, it involves the moon. You heard of the full moon principle? <laughs> right? You heard that? Um, the sun, the S-U-N, is out there shining in our solar system, lightens our world, and as we see the moon traverse across the sky, we see it, you know, we see the new moon, then we see the quarter and the half, the three-quarter. We see the full moon, etc., etc. What has God done there? What, what kind of illustration has He actually just put in the heavens for us to observe every single day, practically? A full moon principle. See, the, the moon has no light of its own. Okay? Um, how much light do we have spiritually? Zero. Zero. And so, as, as the uh, moon... Uh, goes in its revolutions and so forth, and we observe it, uh, and, we, and we see the full moon. That's, that's, we're seeing the full reflection from the S-U-N. But why, at certain times of the month, why is it that we see a quarter moon, uh, a half moon, etc.? Why is that? Because this world gets in the way. Right? And what we're seeing here in Revelation is a depiction of a Christian in their spiritual walk with Yeshua. Does he want us to shine like a quarter moon? A half moon? What, ha what happens when we're shining as a half moon or a three quarter or a quarter? What's, what's happening actually? This world is getting in the way. See? 
And so what we're seeing in Revelation here is that these remnant are shining like a full moon. Okay? They're reflecting the full light of Yeshua. Nothing in this world is blocking any of that out. It's amazing. And, and God put that up there for us as an illustration that we can be reminded of every single day. He wants us to shine like a full moon. He doesn't want any of this world to get in the way. And that's what we see here. We see a group of people that, uh, that get it. They're, 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 be, they're understanding the time. This is the time. This is the time to really get serious, really get committed, really get convicted. This is the time for, for self to come off the throne. And for Yeshua, for our will to be so closely identified with His that what we do is natural in a sense. That's going to be very difficult, isn't it? Because the enemy is going to try to not only deceive us, but to put us through the fire. But we need to be like the three Hebrew worthies on the plain of Dura, bound even with ropes, thrown into the fire. The furnace heated seven times hotter. That's important, significant. But what gets burned off? Just the ropes. They don't even have any smell of smoke when they come out. See? Because who comes right there with them? Yeshua is right there with them. And that's the same here with the remnant. The remnant are walking with Yeshua. And anything that's, that, that they try to use to bind just falls away. There'll come a time when they, they try to hunt you down. And they'll, they'll raise their weapons to try to, to, to destroy you, to, to take you out. And those weapons will just fall limp. We'll be able to use them. Because who is fighting for us? We're being protected by angels that excel in strength and power. There's a, uh, there's a story in the Bible that really highlights and provides even greater detail as to what's going on with this remnant group. Do you know that? If any of you have ever been to a uh, Revelation seminar, you, you are aware that out of the 404 verses, 276 of them are quotations from other parts of the Bible, primarily the Old Testament. Okay? So, you know, like three quarters... John is a scholar. He, he studied the, the Old Testament scrolls. And so he's pulling from his vast knowledge of that that insight, plus he's, he's looking at visions and he's talking to angels and so forth. And, and all of that is a happening so that it can become an end time fulfillment and not just applications. You see, the book was written, right? The book was written back here, right? John wrote his book back around, you know, probably 90, maybe even 80, 80 AD. He's been banished to the Isle of Patmos. Oh, I got to say this because I see, I see some... Some seniors here today. i got to just say that you're reminding me of this. You know, sometimes when you get older, you feel like, well, I'm old, I'm getting slow. You know, I don't think quite as quick as I used to be, but um, maybe God's done with me. I'm just going to go over here and sit in the rocking chair on the porch, watch life go by, right? Let, let others, you know, that have the young legs and the strong legs and the strong... We'll let them go ahead and finish everything. John is put on Patmos. Now, he, he went through some, some uh, really excruciating experiences, but they can't kill him off, and so they banish him. And what does he do on Patmos? But the, makes the greatest contribution in his life. <laughs> For, to, for Christianity. He's 80, 90 years old, maybe older perhaps, you know, and, and God is giving him, giving him visions and he's writing things down and he's sending it out to the churches. You know, there were, there were a number of churches around Asia Minor, but he picks out just seven to send a certain message to. And it was because of their character. 
You see, another six to one ratio is that all of the messages to the seven churches, the first six churches, are all combined in the seventh. If you study it out, you'll find that to be true. The description of Yeshua in the first chapter, six identifying characteristics. He's described with six characteristics, you know, head and hair that are, that are white, you know, eyes aflame of fire, feet of brass, six things describing the being of Yeshua, a six to one ratio. All through scripture, we see this over and over again. It's absolutely amazing. But there's a story in the Old Testament that I want to take you to because I've got about 15 minutes left here. I want to take you back to the book of Judges. It's a story you're familiar with. Story of Judges. And there was a man that was called that ended up being a judge in Israel. And when you read through Judges chapter 6 and 7, all of you, I'm sure, are aware of the story of Gideon. Right? Story of Gideon. And it's just fascinating how God calls him. This young man who was hiding. And why was, why was he hiding? He was hiding because the Midianites were causing all kinds of grief and all kinds of problems. Right? And so they're, they're, they had to go to obscure places to grow their wheat and so forth and to, to harvest it, etc. In fact, uh, I'm looking here, uh, verse 33 of chapter 6. It says, All the Midianites and Amalekites, the people of the east, gathered together. They crossed over and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. So they're down there in the valley of Jezreel. But it says, The Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. And he blows the trumpet, and he gathers behind him, and he sends messages throughout all of the, of the land, and people start responding to this message that he has sent out, right? He sends messages to all the tribes. God has called him to play the, the, the role of Savior for the people of Israel around during this time. And of course... Uh, He's quite certain that he's the one that's been chosen, right? <laughs> no, he's quite apprehensive. He's quite apprehensive, you know. He said, look, I'm the least in my father's house. What are you, what are you talking to me for? Can't you see what I'm doing here? I'm, I'm scared, so I'm up here doing this in the, in the hills. But yet, <laughs> the angel is quite sure. And who do you think that angel could have been? <laughs> yes, I think so. So it says here, so Gideon said to God, if you'll save Israel by my hand, as you have said, he's going to put out a fleece, right? And so he puts the fleece out, and we know the story of that. And he becomes convinced, the Lord encourages him and inspires him that you're my guy. I know, I'm telling you, you're my guy. So when we get to chapter 7, uh, it says here, the first two verses, and this is interesting. It says, uh, Then uh, Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him, rose early and encamped beside the well of Herod, so that the camp of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Moray in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, now this is key, The people who are with you are too many. Too many. For me to give the Midianites into their hands. Okay? So Gideon has amassed the army. You probably realize in the story, Gideon has amassed an army of how many? 32,000, right? Well, you might not know what K is, but let's say 32,000. Okay. 32,000 have responded to the call. I'm sure uh, General Gideon was quite pleased with the response, but he still knew that he was outnumbered at least four to one. But, you know, but look, this is Yeshua's army. And four to one, what are those kind of, ah, oh, that's just nothing. Yeah, hey, we'll take care of that, no problem, right? Of course, 
Yeah, four to one, no problem. You know? But what does what is what does Yahweh say to him? There's too many. And then he tells us exactly why. Lest they vaunt themselves against me, saying, Look what we have done. <laughs> we look what we've done. You know, our mighty armor, we, uh, army, we chased them away. We defeated them. And so, here's the thing. Yahweh knew that He was going to give them the victory. He already knew that, okay? And He wasn't going to allow them to claim the victory for themselves. This was going to be His victory. So what does He have to do? He has to start whittling the number down, doesn't he? He has to start whittling the number down. And so uh, Gideon has forgotten something. You know, in his upbringing, in his schooling, Gideon knows that there is an Israeli military protocol. Right? Because we're talking about military. You actually find that in Deuteronomy 20, the first eight verses, is the Israeli military protocol. Okay? And he, Yahweh taps him on the shoulder and he says, Gideon, you forgot to make the declarations. Because see, Gideon already knew he was still outnumbered four to one. So he, he didn't bother with that because he didn't want anybody leaving. You know, four to one's not bad, but we can, we can handle that. And so Yahweh reminds him, make the declaration and the declaration, really, you can read it later, but it, su- it sums up like this. If you have been, if you just recently got married, and you haven't been married for more than a year, you're dismissed if you're a newlywed. If you've built a house, and you really haven't lived in it for more than a year, you are dismissed. Or if you've planted a garden, if you've planted crops, and you've not harvested them, you can be dismissed. Or... If you are afraid, if you are fearful, you can go home, okay? So when Gideon finally relents and says, well, we'll give it a try, you know, maybe it'll work. I hope hope it doesn't do what what it could. He makes the declarations, and what happens? Wow. Wow. 22,000 leave. Right? Man, that's a lot of building and farming and marrying going on. (laughs) Isn't it? That's a lot of this. But what what does Yahweh say to him? Still too many. That's... Now, you think maybe General Gideon is getting a little... (laughs) <laughs> concerned, you know, he, he feels confident that God has called him, but then he sees Yahweh whittling down his army, right? And of course, he's doing it on purpose, isn't he? And he's doing it for a reason, right? What does Yahweh say? He says, okay, march them down to the river, and I will test them. I will test them. See? And so they go down to the river, and you're familiar with the story. You know, many of them throw off their armament, you know, and they get down on their hands and knees, and they're just lapping the water up like, a, like an animal and so forth. But there are a few who walk through the river, and they just pick up in their hands. They cup their hand, and they just scoop up some water, and they drink it as they walk across because they are expecting an immediate advance on the enemy. And what do they end up with? They end up with 300. Now why is Yahweh whittling this number down? Pardon me? Is that 6 to 1? It's not. He asked me if it was 6 to 1. <laughs> okay. It's not 6 to 1. Okay. Anybody know how many uh, Midianites are in the Jezreel Valley there? The Bible tells us. Anybody have an idea? 
Okay, that's close. That's a little too much. 135,000 Midianites in the valley. Okay. Now I'm going to see if you get this. I'll see how close you're paying attention. If you run the numbers, Gideon's 300 to 300, 135,000, you do come to a ratio, Kirk. Okay. The ratio, we'll put it over here. Anybody find that significant? What was it with Jonathan and his armor bearer? You'll have to check. What about another story that deals with the same ratio? <laughs> Elijah going up Mount Carmel, right? Against the 450 prophets of Baal. Wow. And what's going to happen there? Yahweh is going to rain fire from heaven and he alone is going to be seen as the victory and he alone is going to receive the glory. There's a connection between those two stories. But what about this little group here? You see, actually the smaller the number, the greater the miracle. You know the very same thing is happening at the end? You know, there may be millions of believers in the world today who are just so grateful to Yeshua for what he's done and, and so positive and such a witness and so forth. But Yahweh is, is going to, in my opinion, he's going to do the very same thing. Because, you know, people are, people are a, a bit taken by the fact that, do you mean God only ends up with 144,000 saints at the end? Okay. Now, some people misunderstand and think that, you know, that's the total number of redeemed. That's just total nonsense. There are going to be multitudes of redeemed in heaven. We read it. Multitudes around the throne. Every nation, kindred, and tongue of people. But at the end, when, when, when his character is on trial, and when his reputation is at stake, you see. He does the same thing he did with Gideon's army. He whittles it down to an impossibility. There's no human way that 300 could go against 135,000. There's no way. It was a phenomenal miracle. It will be just as phenomenal at the end, maybe even more so. Okay? Let's talk about these guys for a minute. Do you realize what Yeshua asked them to do? They know the size of the army that's down there in the valley. They've gone down there and checked it out. They've gone down there and spied it out, right? You know the story. But can you imagine? Can you imagine? Yahweh is going to ask them. Yahweh has instructed Gideon. Okay, Gideon, here's your armament. You're going to go into battle. You're going to split up in three divisions. You're going to stand around the hillside. <laughs> With your trumpet and your torch. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Bring it on. Bring it on, guys. Got my trumpet and my torch. <laughs> See, you need to, we need to try to put ourselves in that place. Because now we are talking all about faith and trust in somebody else for the victory. Absolutely. Can you imagine that? Here's your trumpet. Here's your torch. And then what you're going to do is you're not going to kind of just give it a little toot, you know, and maybe just kind of light a match and hold it by your jacket, you know, so that nobody can see where you are. Oh, no. At the right moment, you've scattered around the hillside. And you're going to let that torch, you're going to hold that torch high, and you're going to give a blast to that trumpet. And you're going to be running down the hill towards these guys. <laughs> right? 
This is the remnant of God being illustrated. This is what God will accomplish with this little group of people. They will be fearless. Fearless. Because they will be operating from the standpoint of perfect love. Fear will be cast out. They're totally trusting in the promises of Yeshua. And they've got their torch, they're holding it high, right? The character, the righteousness of Yeshua is shining brightly. And they're blasting it on their trumpets from the hilltops and the housetops. (laughs) Nothing can dissuade them. They've been called. They're the called, the few, the called and the chosen that Revelation talks about, (laughs) right? Now this means, of course that many will be laid to rest before that time comes. What happened to the... What happened to all these people that went home? You know, the uh, the (laughs) 31,700 that that said, you know, you guys are dismissed. Well, they received all of the benefit of the victory of the 300, right? They received all the benefit. You know, God selected a group of people. You know, I hear people sometimes wondering uh, or asking the question, you know, who are the 144,000? Who are they? I think we're all to, we, we ought to all strive to be among that group. But you know what? We've got to trust that, that, Yesh- that Yeshua knows exactly who He needs to have. Exactly. He will pick them just like He did with Gideon's 300. He'll pick them. He'll choose them. You see, and he will give them all the weaponry they need. He will give them the torch and the trumpet, and they will go forth, trusting, totally trusting, completely in his plan, because he is the victory. Amen. Amen? He is the victory. You see, isn't it amazing how <laughs> it's amazing to me how God's word just completes the story. You know, we get into looking here, not realizing that something back here it helps with the explanation. That's the way it works. It all works together for good, doesn't it? See. Scripture also tells us one last thing. And that's in Revelation chapter 14. Talking about this very time. Because I don't want anybody to be discouraged about the possibility of being laid to rest. The Bible doesn't present it that way. It presents it the exact opposite way. Here is the patience of the saints, it says in verse 12. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Yeshua. And, and a lot of people are familiar with that verse. They, they know it by heart. They quote it. Then I heard a voice, the very next verse, 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write... I mean, this is something that John is specifically supposed to record, right? Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. We have the promise of Yeshua that He will not allow us to be overwhelmed by any temptation, any trial without making a way of escape. For many at the end, that escape will be being laid to rest. And that will be a blessing. And see, what I'm saying to you is it doesn't really make any difference whether we're laid to rest or whether we're one of the chosen that go forth to give that trumpet a certain sound. It doesn't make any difference as long as we're in Yeshua, you see. But rest assured, the miracle will be stupendous, just like it was in the Jezreel Valley so long ago. And I say, praise God, we must trust you wholeheartedly. And it will come to pass. And it will come to pass sooner than we think. We have very little time left, according to the blueprint. You know, you can run the numbers. You know, what are we up to here? You know, we're getting very, very close to the end of the blueprint. Now, what are we also told? What are we also told about this blueprint? It'll be cut short. For righteousness sake. You know, Tom mentioned 
Revelation 12 says that he put the scripture on the board there. Don't you think the enemy knows this? He knows it. How does he know his time is short? Because he can count. He can count. See? So, brothers and sisters, we are right there. We are right there. I don't know how, I don't know what words I can say to you that will get across to your hearts and minds that we are, we are right there. Okay? And Tom is laying out the fine detail of that. You know, the last seven years. And that could start very, very soon, you see? Very soon. And we're going to have to be ready for that. Ready for that. Self off the throne. How do we get self off the throne? How do we get self off the throne? We yield our will to His Lordship. We get up every single day and we say, here is a blank sheet of paper. Please write out your agenda. You know, we don't think like that, especially if you're engaged in business and work and keeping up with the family and the kids and the house and everything, you know. We don't think like that. But what does this say? Seek me early and you will find me. You know? We need to ask. Most of all, we need to ask. It's not something that's going to happen automatically. We need to ask Him, please empty us. Empty us of, of the thing that we trust the most. We trust ourselves the most. We've got to take it off the throne. And plead for that outpouring of the Spirit that will direct us in this time. And you know what? Let me say this too. Anybody that's called, and, and, the, and Scripture is very clear, we're coming to the place where, mar I mean, martyrs are happening even today. I hope you realize that. People are being martyred even now, probably as I speak. Yeah, they are. But that's in another land. It's far away. You know, it's, it's, we don't think about it. But it's coming here. It's coming soon. But rest assured, if God calls you to lay down your life, if you trust Him enough with your life and He calls you to, to forfeit that life, be assured that's happening for a reason. There's somebody else that's going to see that. There's somebody else that's going to realize what's going on. And it will have an impact because He would never call us to do something like that without it being a tremendous witness for the truth. Okay? So please, trust Him completely. Pray without ceasing. And He will guide our paths. Let's pray. Oh, Father, in the name of Yeshua, thank You so much for granting us an understanding of where we are in time. We, we are knowing the time. And it's high time that we get off the throne and give You complete authority over our lives. Because, Lord, we want to be in that army. We want to be in that army that, that gives the trumpet a, a certain sound and holds the torch high. But we know that's a proprietary group. And, and even though we may not be there, we, we can rest assured in you that you will use us to full capacity in some way to be a, a witness and a testimony to your glory, to your truth. So thank you, Lord, no matter, no matter what calling you have on our lives, <laughs> Yeshua will be glorified. His name will be exalted in all the earth. Forgive us. Forgive us for the entanglements that we've developed in our own lives, the things that, that, that just suck up our time and attention and our treasure. When now is the moment, when now is the time to give you full commitment, full consecration in every area. I think of, of Noah and the family and his commitment that he made for 120 years. That was his full-time project to prepare for the closing of the world's probation. And we are at the same juncture, we're at the same place. Probation's hours are about to close. 
And we didn't live 100 or 200 or 500 years ago, but we're living now. You have us now here. And that's for a reason. So, Father, let us all, in the name of Yeshua, play the part, play the role that you've called us to play. Let us be faithful unto the end so that the mighty miracle of what you have done in handling the problem of sin will bring glory and honor to your character, to your name. And your creation will be secure for all eternity because your character has been vindicated. The question has been answered. Your law has been exalted. Thank you and praise you that we can be a part, a co-laborer in honoring that law, and honoring that character. Father, please use us in the finishing of your great work because we ask it in the name of Yeshua. In his strength, we go forward from here. Amen and amen.